Hello, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. Um, pleasure to be speaking with you today. Um, I'll just jump onto the, the first slide. Um, so my name's John Hackett. Um, that is, in fact, a picture of me. Uh, excuse the hair loss. Um, it's been a tough, tough couple of years, two kids, global pandemic. We've all been through it. I've been working for Solvay for about nine years now in various application engineering, customer engineering, uh, application development roles. If you don't know Solvay, I'm not going to spend too much time introducing Solvay. Um, maybe just Google us. Beyond that, come and visit us on stand M41. What I would like to talk to you about is composite battery enclosures, and particularly the solution that we will be, I'll be presenting to you today, and the kind of considerations that you need to make to the materials manufacturing design. So I'd like to start with a fairly simple question, but one that's got a fairly complex answer. So why are composite materials not more widely used for battery enclosures? Now, the, the technical information that I'm going to try and present to you today in around 20, 25 minutes is, uh, is covering about two years' worth of work. So I'm not going to be able to go into the full technical detail of all of these attributes. But I've put this on the screen, so you've got a, a, a reference of the sort of things that you need to consider. And as a lot of you are probably familiar with, the design, the materials, and the manufacturing, as soon as you change one, that has an influence on the other. Now, in particular, the battery enclosure is a very complex set of attributes and requirements that you're trying to cover all at the same time in a single box. So the solution that I'm going to show to you, share with you today, um, as I say, it's been developed over the last couple of years, around two years now. Um, it started with uh, teaming up with Ricardo. So for those of you who don't know, Ricardo are a design engineering consultancy company. Um, They've got a lot of expertise, but one of their areas of expertise is battery enclosures, metallic, specifically metallic battery enclosures. So between Solvay's composite knowledge and Ricardo's battery enclosure design vehicle knowledge, it made a pretty good partnership um, and something that we're still continuing to work with. So the, our virtual composite design was sort of developed in two phases. Um, my colleague Mark actually presented on the first phase last year, and we've now developed a second phase that's more robust, that's more developed, and shows off the, uh, the, the attributes of composite battery enclosures to a, to a higher degree. This is a complete composite battery enclosure. So this isn't just a composite cover with, with a metallic underlay. This is a full composite tray, composite cover, composite cross members. Our focus really was improving volumetric and mass energy density, or, or energy density and specific energy density. We've carried out full structural loadings um, and carried out simulations to, to ensure that this composite design meets all structural requirements. Just a quick little uh, walkthrough of the, of the two different phases and why they look different. So the incumbent metal design, this is the uh, Ricardo in-house design. Uh, this uses fairly traditional methods. So we're talking about steel, enclosure, aluminum cross members. The battery layout is a pouch design with aluminum modules. And this is, a, as you say, a fairly traditional with 36 modules. During the first phase of the project, we didn't touch the modules. So the design is this, the, the battery layout is the same. We focused on improving volumetric energy, energy density, so that we had more space within the pack to play with during that design, but we didn't actually fill it with any more batteries. So what we've done in the second phase is we've optimized that uh, battery layout by using a larger module format and managed to significantly increase the power output of that battery. Now, we don't have a direct metallic comparison to this second phase, uh, and the simple reason for that is that using the incumbent steel sections, you would not be able to package these modules um, in a steel enclosure. Now, it's not to say that with a lot of design work and a lot of optimization, you couldn't make a, a, a steel or aluminum pack that would package this, but with the existing technology, the existing um, structure of, the, of a, a traditional pack, you can't package this much battery in this type of space, which this is important, important to make. So I'll start just by running through the numbers so that we can see um, uh, the kind of benefits that a composite pack can offer, and then I'll go into some of the design uh, considerations that we've had to make along the way. So between the metallic pack and the first phase, the power output hasn't changed and the modules haven't changed. So we have 36 modules, 94 kilowatt hours. In an EF segment vehicle that this is, this is, this is fairly standard, this is fairly traditional. Um, what we've managed to do with the second phase by going to a larger module fa form factor, we've increased that power output from to, to 104 kilowatts. So we've got over 10% increase in power for the same ex exterior space. Now, some of that comes from the fact that we've moved to a larger module form factor. But as I stated before, using current steel sections, you can't package this much battery into this kind of space. 
So as I said before, the, the two things that we're really focusing on is, is uh, volumetric density or, or energy density, um, and then mass density or, or specific energy density, depending on your terminology. So you can see here in the volume, the volume of the metallic design is 428. So that's the exterior volume in liters of the pack. Take away the amount of space in liters that you've got inside. So that's the volume that they, the enclosure itself takes up. And as you can see, between the metallic design to our phase two design, we've increased, uh, we've decreased 100 liters for the enclosure. So there's an extra 100 liters either inside the pack to package batteries or potentially to, to reduce the size of the battery pack altogether and have, have more space in your vehicle. Now those values in terms of liters are very specific to this design. But what we can look at as a, a more generic value to compare to others is, is the volumetric density or, or energy density. Now 220 for the, for the existing metallic design is, is pretty good. You know, Ricardo are quite proud of this metallic uh, steel section uh, design that they've got. Moving to 270, uh, at the time we were fairly sure that this was market leading. We've now increased that further to 317 uh, watt hours per liter. So this is pretty game changing stuff. Um, the same goes with the mass of the enclosure. So we were actually taking volume efficiency first and, and, and specific energy density second. So uh, most of this, this weight saving has actually come as a, as a, as a natural uh, use of switching to composites. But still, we've gone from 141 kilograms in the steel pack down to just 85. Uh, the eagle-eyed among you will see that the phase one design was at, actually at 66 kilograms, so we've actually increased from the phase one design. Um, I'll touch on some of the reasons for that, but effectively that's because we're, we're now packaging large, more batteries. We're packaging larger modules, and we've had to make some design changes because of that. But as you can see, the, gen, the, the, the more generic values of mass density or specific energy density of uh, increasing from 141 up to 184 watt hours per kilogram uh, is, is well above market leading, let's put it that way, in terms of uh, uh, current automotive solutions. Now, of course, putting just some numbers on the screen without be, uh, being able to prove and demonstrate that the composite design does everything that the metal design can do is, is, is ineffective. Now, what I'm going to show you in the next few slides, uh, particularly the next two slides, is about six months' worth of pretty intense work between ourselves and Ricardo that I'm trying to summarize in just two slides. So if you, need to know, if you want to know some more information about this, please come and find us. Please come and talk to us. Um, because effectively, the, the internal report for the next two slides is 284 pages long. So I'm trying to summarize quite a lot of work into quite a short period of time. But I want to give a touch, uh, a touch of information that, that this isn't just, a, this isn't just a, a, a small fag packet sketch, as we say in the UK. There's a lot of work that's gone behind this design. We've validated this to a pretty high degree. Now, the structural requirements that we've sent our pack through um, and met in simulation uh, are kind of a mix of international, regional, and OEM requirements. Um, but generally, we've taken the most severe, the most difficult test to pass to make sure that we're, we're, we're really testing and stretching our, our composite materials. The enclosure crush is the perfect example of this. So the enclosure crush is here to uh, is a test, um, a, a variation of which is, is applied globally. So we've chosen the GBT, which is the Chinese standard, effectively because it uses a smaller pole, uh, so a, a, a tighter uh, impact radius. So it's generally the most difficult to meet. Uh, the enclosure crush um, requirement is effectively there to protect the battery during transport. So if something were to happen to the battery, it was dropped, it was driven into with a forklift truck, there's a certain degree of strength, inherent strength of that pack that means that the energy within it is still kept safe. Um, Effectively, this means that we have to apply 100, 100 kilonewtons of pressure, so that's a pretty, pretty significant force, anywhere around the perimeter of the pack. So we, we applied this force in four, four different areas around the pack to test the, the, the various weak points of the, pass, the, the, the pack, um, and 100 kilonewtons was exceeded in all cases. The, the rear of the pack here was actually the most challenging for us, um, partly because, mainly because of the, uh, the distance between the modules and the rear pack meant that we had the least amount of room. Modal stiffness was actually a lot easier to meet. Uh, composite materials are inherently quite stiff. They're inherently quite dampening. Uh, regardless, Ricardo uh, assessed 11 modes um, to standard OEM requirements. Using mode one there as the example, um, 35 hertz is generally the minimum. 50 hertz is pretty good. We've managed to hit 73 hertz without really trying. So modal performance, very efficient. Uh, in general, if you're looking for uh, low fatigue and low NVH, composite materials is a really good bet. 
Another un slightly unexpected challenge as we moved to phase two was module retention and clamping. So for those of you who don't know how a battery, uh, traditional automotive battery pack is, is laid out, your modules are typically sat on top of a cooling plate. Now you want to be able to transfer the, the thermal energy between the two effectively, but you don't want electrical uh, uh, conduct conduction. So you have either a gap pad or a gap paste. Uh, this is to provide thermal conductivity, but electrical insulation. Now, there are two main sort of materials that you can use for this. There's a thermal paste or a thermal pad. Thermal pads are becoming far more, um, uh, far more common because it's easier to, re to, to repair, to disassemble the pack. However, what they require is a very even distribution of pressure uh, between the cooling plate and the module. Um, this is to ensure that you get good effective cooling, um, but without um, compromising the electrical insulation. As we went from a small module form factor to a larger module form factor, um, the amount of stiffness required in the floor to, uh, to, to maintain an even pressure uh, gets exponentially larger. Now the way that the metallic guys normally get around this is by having a double floor with a uh, quite fine array of, um, of cross members underneath. They're effectively making a honeycomb type structure to stiffen the floor. We didn't want to do that because we didn't want to uh, lose the, the volumetric efficiency that we that we'd just gained. So instead, we've used a mixture of geometry and also local stiffening using some carbon fiber ribs to stiffen the floor to allow us to still have a single floor but still be able to meet the, the module retention requirements. I'm going to focus on a couple of abuse cases here. Again, these are generally the two most severe. Um, the first one is, is, is a vehicle level crash. So this is the end cap side pole crash. It's the one that's most difficult for the battery because it's the closest uh, intrusion to the battery um, it, it being the side pole. Even still, we didn't want to make lives too easy on ourselves. So we made sure that we had two, two clear distinctions of pass. One of which is that we wanted to, the energy absorbed by the battery to still be the same ratio as the vehicle. So what we didn't want to do is to have our battery fold away and then allow for the, the rest of the metallic vehicle to take up that, some of that energy force. So we wanted to make sure that we were hitting 13.8 kilojoules of energy absorbed in this side pole crash. Now the pass failure for this is no rupture and no explosion and no leakage. So technically you can damage the modules, but the safest way of ensuring this crash, uh, uh, safest way to, to ensure a successful crash test is to have no contact with the modules. Um, we've met that with 16 millimeters of clearance to the modules in this side pole crash. Underfloor intrusion or underfloor protection, there's generally two ways of looking at this. There's the high speed, the high impact. So this might be where you drive over something, you drive over a brick, a tow ball hitch, um, and damage the underside of the vehicle. Or there's the abuse jacking. We've chosen the abuse jacking because for composites, this is probably the more difficult test to meet. Um, effectively, our floor at this stage is six millimeters of solid glass. So a high speed deflection impact, um, effectively we've got an armored floor anyway, it would be relatively easy for us to pass. The abuse jacking on the other hand, because we have a single floor rather than a double floor, is always gonna be more difficult for us to pass. Uh, we've tested this in four positions. So uh, three of those positions are with 150 millimeter diameter bollard. So this is where uh, you might drive your vehicle over a parking bollard, the parking bollard lifts um, and, and damages the underside of your vehicle. Um, the fourth case is with a 50 millimeter jack. So this is a misuse of a jack. So you're, you're taking your, your bottle jack and you've placed it in the wrong place. You've missed the rocker and you're lifting half of the, the weight of the vehicle um, purely by that 50 millimeter diameter. In both of these cases, the floor was able to protect both the cooling tray and the, and the modules from further damage. So as I say, there's a lot of work that's gone into those two slides. So if you want more information about that, please come and find us. We're happy to, happy to talk to that. I could talk about any one of those, I think probably for an hour. Um, so be pre-warned if you come and talk to me about one of these, I, I, might, I might talk your head off. One of the other things we wanted to make to ensure was that we could actually manufacture this at high rate. So we've carried out a manufacturing simulation um, and a virtual assessment on all of the components. The example here is the top cover. So we used a, a software called Aniform for this. Um, this is where, and you can, effectively what you can see here is that we were having some tight spots, some tight radii and some thinning and some thickening of the material. Um, both along the corner, the rear corners, but also along these uh, uh, fi fixtures, points along the, the side of the vehicle. So we've simpli simpl simplified those, those geometry features, and we've now got a part that we can form in a single piece uh, for press molding. Um, and all of the parts within our solution are press moldable. 
EMI shielding, another one that was fairly new to me when I got into to battery enclosures. EMI shielding isn't typically required for, for other automotive or, or, or aerospace requirements, but very integral to, uh, to a battery enclosure. So we can actually test this uh, in one of our sites in the US to uh, what is effectively the gold standard, the ASTM D4935 standard. Um, however, even still, there's some limitations in this, and we're accepting those limitations. So one, uh, as we move to 5G technology, those frequencies are getting higher and higher. The other one is this really focuses on the electro uh, field and electrical interference. As you go lower in, in, uh, in frequency um, into the magnetic field, there are some, there are some limitations, uh, effectively practical limitations. Um, at around 10 kilohertz, for example, your, your radar transceiver and, and receiver need to be two meters wide. So from a practical point, there's, there's some limitations there. However, this gives a pretty, good, pretty, pretty wide array of the performance of composite materials. There's two trend lines there. One is the green line at about 50, 50 de decibels of shielding effectiveness. And the other one in the pink line at the top is the trend line for metals. So one to two millimeters of aluminum or steel will give you 85 to, to 90%, 90 decibel reduction. Yeah. Now there's two, the, the top two materials there, the two gray dotted lines are in two millimeters carbon, UD and woven. We're seeing pretty similar results there. So whether you're using a woven or a, or a UD format, uh, you're getting pretty similar results. You'll then see a very clear correlation between the thickness of the material and the shielding effectiveness. Um, so as you go thinner, not all that unsurprisingly, your, uh, your shielding effectiveness reduces. However, one thing that we've also included on this chart, just, to, just so everybody's aware, is that there's, uh, there's not only the mass of the carbon that has an influence on this EMR shielding, um, but it's also the length of the fiber. So the, uh, the yellow line that is not quite meeting that, that 50 decibel um, shielding effectiveness there is a carbon SMC. So this is a five millimeter standard SMC. It's at 40% fill. So the amount of carbon in that 1.22 millimeters is actually more than the 0.6 carbon woven in terms of weight of carbon. So there's, a, there's, a, there's, there's two things to consider when we're looking at the amount of carbon that you need. There's the length of the fiber and also the volume of the fiber. But as you can see, we can test this internally at Solvay and make, uh, depending on the exact requirements, pretty good, um, uh, pretty good suggestions on, of what material might meet your requirements. Okay, so thermal runaway, and this is the big one. This is one that's had everybody excited over the last, last couple of years. In particular, GBT 38031, uh, the 2020 standard came into effect for all vehicles sold in China in 2020, uh, from January in 2021. Um, and effectively what this standard says is that um, your overcharge protection, your overheating protection, and your mechanical protection don't matter. It assumes that one of those is gonna go wrong. One of your cells goes into thermal runaway and you still need to protect the passengers. So this test forces the cell to go into thermal runaway by one of those methods. Um, and you then have to uh, demonstrate five minutes of uh, safe escape for the passengers from the vehicle. There's some slight OEM interpretation here, um, but the main, the main variation here is the amount of uh, variation in, in the battery layout, the cell type, um, where it's placed in the vehicle, what's around the vehicle, um, and so what we're really trying to look at here is take a component level qualification and then loop back around to find out what the material level requirements are. Now the main way that we're looking at this is we're, just we're understanding our materials in the finest level of detail that, was, that we can so that when we come up with a component level qualification, we can suggest the best material with data to, to, to back that up. So the first thing that we looked at, again, this was part of our Ricardo study, was a thermal runaway simulation. I perhaps unfairly called it a basic thermal runaway simulation there. Um, it's not basic, it's quite advanced, sorry Ricardo. But one of the things that we need to highlight and understand is that there's no dynamic loading or breakdown of the materials. So none of the materials are melting, none of them are burning, none of them are breaking down during this simulation. But what it does give us is it gives us the energy that's released during this, um, during this event, and it also gives us a time um, during this event. The useful things that we can extract from this from a composite point of view is the temperatures that the various composites are getting to. So unsurprisingly, the coolant channel and the cooling fluid, which are thermally connected to the, to the modules, um, are getting pretty hot, over 600 degrees Celsius. Also, more useful for the composite, though, is the composite ribs, um, both the, the cross members on the lower and the, comp the cover ribs on the top, are reaching 280, 290 degrees Celsius. Uh, the co top cover, 218, but the base tray, 510 degrees. So the base tray 
during the actual main thermal runaway event, it's going to get hotter than, it, than the surrounding components. Um, one thing we also have to bear in mind, though, that this is just the thermal event. There's no burning, there's no fire after this event. So for, for this particular simulation, it stops once the thermal event of the, and the thermal release of the thermal runaway has, has been released. Any other further burning from materials within the pack, uh, from oxygen entering the pack, um, isn't simulated from this. But what that does mean is that we need to understand what our materials will do um, from a fire protection point of view. So internally at Solve, we can do burn through torch testing. This is the obvious way to test this material. Um, we have a range of different uh, capabilities in Solve. We typically use a flame temperature around 1100 degrees Celsius. Uh, we use torch output somewhere in the, the, the half a kilowatt to four kilowatt range. Um, and we're testing two things. We're not just testing fire penetration here, but we're also testing back face temperature. So what's important is um, the surrounding materials and how hot they're allowed to get effectively. We've also got some development tests. Um, so one is uh, an impingement where we apply a force to this material. And the other one is uh, effectively uh, compression after impact. But instead of an impact, we're using flame. Um, these tests are under development, so if these are interesting to you, if this is the sort of thing that you'd like to know more about, please come and find us. We're developing these tests right now, so we, we'd welcome industry, uh, industry input. Of course, this doesn't perfectly represent a thermal runaway. Uh, instead, one of the things that we're using to rely on that is UL2596. I won't go into details of this particular test. Um, it's now a published test, um, so you can find the standards from UL. I think there's Composite World articles on this. But effectively, you've got 25 cells sitting in a steel box. The material on the top is, a, is your test material. So the only two differences between the top and the bottom here is, is thickness. So we're using our very low level baseline material. This is a, a, a basic FR epoxy on fiberglass. We have materials that significantly outperform this. But if I run the test, you'll see the, the dramatic difference between a pass in this particular situation and a fail in this situation. So what's happened so far is two of the cells have gone into thermal runaway. They're about to send the rest of the cells into thermal runaway. You can see on the lower cell, we've already got a slight breakage in the upper, and we're seeing smoke coming, up, coming through the top of the, the, the cover. Now, the top cover, the top sample is withstanding that. All the sparks coming out of the side are perfectly expected. That's the exhaust port. The failure on the bottom, however, oxygen is getting into the pack. There's a fire within the pack, and this is just 25 cells. If you're driving a Tesla, you've got several hundred of the same size cell as this, over 700 cells. So the amount of energy that's in a real pack is significantly higher than this. Um, it obviously doesn't perfectly represent that, but we are taking an extreme case because this, in this particular case, the pressure is probably higher than an automotive pack, and the distance of our test material to the batteries is closer. So there's a balance of the, you can't perfectly represent the amount of energy that's being given off but you can try and put your material in a slightly more um, extreme um, situation by having it closer and at a higher pressure. So there's a correlation that we can kind of understand there, and that's exactly what we're doing to work at the moment. So uh, as I'm quickly running out of time, I wanted to just jot this up again, just so you're aware. I haven't been able to go into the full details of all of these attributes. If there's one of these that, you, that sparks your interest, if there's one of these that you, if you're looking at a composite battery enclosure and you don't have an answer to one of these, Come and speak to us because we've got pretty good knowledge around, uh, around all of these areas. So just a quick summary of the composite design solution that we're, that we're currently proposing and currently looking at. It's a pretty balanced solution. We're not, we're not looking at one extreme end of the other. It's a complete composite design. All of the main structural requirements are composites. It meets all OEM requirements. So we're talking about structural loads, abuse cases, assembly manufacture, environmental and fatigue, fire protection, thermal runaway, and even EMI, depending on your requirements. It's suitable for high rate manufacture. We can press mold all of these components in a sub 10 minute time. We're looking at 40% weight saving against steel. We're looking at a 30% energy density increase. Um, and it's using a mixture of carbon and fiberglass uh, products. Obviously, if you were looking at a higher performing, uh, even, even lower weight solution, uh, we could use more carbon to increase these benefits even further. Just before I finish, I do want to, make, just want to highlight that we're not resting on our laurels and this is the design solution. This isn't the final design solution. This is just one particular, this is a solution for this one particular use case. But a perfect example of what we're doing moving forward is the Beamer project. So it's a project that I'm leading, leading over the next sort of 18 months. 
We've teamed up with Airborne to demonstrate a complete understanding of the material manufacturing and design in practical, physical components. So we'll be building real batteries, we'll be testing them to uh, battery enclosures, composite battery enclosures, we'll be testing them to fire, thermal runaway and EMI requirements, we'll be de developing design for manufacture guidelines. Airborne will be looking at integrating this manufacturing solution um, with business process automation, and we'll be looking at a complete cost and environmental uh, impact assessment. I think I'm pretty much out of time there, so I will leave that uh, as we are. Um, I'm not sure if we've got time for questions, but please, uh, if, you, if, if this sparks your interest, um, I'll be on the Solvay stand M41 all day. Um, by all means, please come and ask us questions. Thank you.